Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now Apple have released the uh, M1 powered uh, MacBook Air along with the MacBook Pro and the Mac Mini. I finally got my hands on one, been playing with it a few days. I've been tweeting about it on my Twitter account at Gary Explains. And today I want to look at performance. Now I'm planning several videos about this device, including a full review. I look at how the x86 emulation works, battery life, and so on. But the first and most important topic for me is the performance. So how does the M1 processor perform? Well, if you want to find out more, please let me explain. <laughs> Okay, so I've got a whole video on this channel about the M1 processor following the information that Apple have launched. Of course, the big thing is this is a processor, they're calling it Apple Silicon because it's a processor designed by Apple. It's got Apple's own uh, CPU design in it. It's got a GPU designed by Apple, probably with some technology from Imagination uh, in there as well. It's got all the other stuff that you need in a, a CPU, in a processor, a system on a chip really, all built into there. It's uh, Apple's design, and of course, it means they're no longer using Intel's processors in the MacBook, which means, of course, we're now having to go through this transition stage, which includes recompiling programs so that they work natively for the M1 processor. There's emulation in there, which I mentioned a second ago, and we'll deal with all that in the other videos. But if you've got native code running on the M1 processor, how well does it work? Let's start by looking at Cinebench. Now, of course, Cinebench uh, looks at the CPU only, not the GPU, and it does ray tracing on the CPU using single core mode and a multi-core mode to kind of get a feel of the speed for it. And lots of people in publishing some graphs, but let's just have a look at those quickly. As we can see here, a very strong score by the Apple processor for single core. 1550 is the overall score, beating lots of Intel and AMD chips along the way. According to this graph, the 2.81 gigahertz 11th generation Intel Core i7 1165G7 just pips it to the post. And when we get to multi-core scores, we can see some very interesting numbers here. It's middle of the chart that uh, Cinebench provide. And if you notice, it's actually doing pretty well compared for example, there's the uh, Xeon, which has got 12 cores and 24 threads. It beats that. And actually, if you look higher up, it's actually beaten by all the processors that beat it there actually have at least 16 threads. Threads is not something you've got yet in the Apple processor. And also remember here, we've got four performance cores and four efficiency cores. So the overall uh, multi-threading score is certainly very reasonable. What's missing from this chart really is the data for the Ryzen 4000 U mobile processors. The uh, idea is that they probably come in just a bit higher than the Apple chip as well, but of course they're using six cores and 12 threads, I think is the minimum configuration. However, very, very good showing there from the Apple processor. Now, of course, because this is Gary Explains, I'm not going to leave these performance numbers just in the hands of third party benchmark writers. I've, of course, written my own. As I've mentioned in another video, I now have my own suite called Speedtest G PC. Now, it runs on Linux and on the Mac and on Windows. And I've been running it with uh, help from some of my colleagues at Android Authority on various Macs I can get my hands on to see what the performance is across Apple's uh, existing range. Now, before we look at the graph for the existing Macs, one thing it's worth noting is there are lots and lots of Mac models. MacBook Pros, for example, just for, if you look at 2018, 2019, 2020, there are 27 different models. I'm not talking about storage configuration, I'm talking about with different CPU configurations. So obviously, if I wanted to test every single Mac, I'd need 27 just for the MacBook Pro. This, you know, I'd need a whole building to do this kind of testing. However, I have got my hands on some Macs, so I was able to do some kind of ballpark testing. So here's the graph of the uh, existing Macs that I was able to get my hand on. It's in seconds, that's how Speedtest G works. So the longer it takes, the slower the device is. And so the bottom one there is a mid-2014 2.8 gigahertz, two core i5 fourth generation processor. And as we go higher up and higher up, the top one there, which manages to finish the test in 64 seconds, is a MacBook Pro 16 inch from 2019 with an eight core i9 processor in it. So what I'm gonna show you now is a side-by-side -side video of Speedtest GPC running on the new M1 and comparing it against that very same MacBook Pro with the i9 processor. Let's see what happens. 
Okay, we have the MacBook Air with the M1 processor on the left-hand side. We have the MacBook Pro with the Intel i9 processor on the right-hand side. And already the M1 is into the 32 thread test, and so is the uh, Air Intel chip. It's now into the Sublec uh, simulator. Both of them here simulating a one-instruction CPU. I've got a whole video about this on the uh, channel. But already the Intel has taken the lead. It's gone into the N Queen's problem, and it's gone past that. It's now into the blur test using one thread. And, oh, look at that. It's now into the blur test using four threads. Well, only now the M1 has gone into the uh, N Queen's problem. It's now into the blur test. So does this mean the Intel chip is going to win overall? But no, 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 it's a comeback, it's a comeback. Look at that, it's going to beat it. It's now gone into the rendering test. While the Intel is still in the blur test, it's now gone into the rendering test. While the M1 is into the compression test, as now is the Intel, so they're both in the final stretch. Which one's going to finish it first? The compression test on the left is further ahead. It started sooner. Will it beat the Intel? This is the question. There it is, yes. 56 seconds on the right hand side. The Intel will finish in, I'm sure. What's it gonna be? Come on, come on, come on, come on. 64 seconds, there you go. And so as you saw there, the M1 came in first. It actually managed to finish the test in 56 seconds. So according to my testing here, and Speedtest GPC is quite unique in that it does single core threading testing and multi-core threaded testing, and it tests things like the launch speed, which will uh, account for things like the internal storage, and also there is some IO going on, particularly in the compression test. So it's a kind of an overall, more real life system test, rather than just hammering it with, for example, just crunching numbers like we've got there in uh, Cinebench or Geekbench. This is much more like what you're gonna get in the real world starting things up some things are single threaded some things are multi-threaded and as we saw there the m1 comes in much much faster than the macbook pro with the i9 so i think that is really quite a solid performance there from apple's newest chip now one of the interesting things about the macbook pro is it doesn't have a fan so we're talking here about passive cooling so a lot of questions are around now how well does it handle the heat will it actually start to throttle when you heat it up? So what I did was this, I took my MacBook Pro fresh in the morning, having been sitting overnight in my office, the surface temperature of the device was around 20 degrees C. I then started running as many programs as I could, which included running Speedtest GPC, also running a Unity test, it's actually the same test that I've got in Speedtest G uh, for the Android and iOS devices, and I, plugged it in so it was charging up as well, creating as much heat as possible. Now, a couple of interesting things. As the processor was heating up, it starts to heat up here, which of course is where we'd expect to find the processor. And actually it was cold here on the outside as the heat dissipated through the casing, it became warm to touch everywhere on the bottom, but particularly remained hot here. And this part here in the middle got up to 41 degrees. So that's 20 something degrees it's gone up with while I was pushing that processor hard. Another interesting thing is the battery stopped charging at one point. I don't know exactly what point, but when I measured it for 41 degrees, I noticed the battery wasn't charging anymore. And that's understandable because battery charging in itself generates heat. So there must be some logic in there that says, hey, when the processor is this hot, and when you're generating heat from the battery, battery charging, stop the battery charging because it's going to be too much. So the battery did stop charging, but the processor kept on running and kept generating that heat. Now, having done all that, what I did was I ran Cinebench again in its multi-core test once it was all heated up to see if there was a performance difference. So let's look at the graph. So the lighter orange number is the uh, Apple MacBook Air when it's cooler, and then the darker brown one there, 7,110, is when it's hot. So it does run slower when it heats up, and of course you'd expect that, but how much slower? Just 5%. We're talking about just a 5% difference from when it's running hot and when it's running cold. And as I said, that whole bottom heated up to 41 degrees in the center there, but the heat was being dissipated through that metal case, and so it didn't need a fan. Now that was the hardest I was able to push it, and it took me an hour of running the processor at maximum CPU usage, maximum GPU usage, simultaneously for an hour, the battery stopped charging because it couldn't cope with the heat, and that was the difference in performance, just 5%. And one final closing thought, that on that graph I showed you there, one of those was actually my MacBook Pro that I already have. It's the 2015 MacBook Pro, and you can see that the MacBook Air is giving me a huge performance increase compared to what I have. And I already used that laptop for many years now when I was traveling around editing videos at all the big shows and things that I went to, and I've had no trouble with it, still working very, very well. But in terms of the performance boost I've gained now by buying the MacBook 
air, I'm very, very happy with my purchase. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. As I said, lots of more videos coming about the MacBook Air and the M1 processor, including a full review, battery life, and so on. So if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're interested in those other videos, then please do stick around by subscribing to the channel. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Very, very happy that I've bought the new MacBook Pro Air. MacBook Pro Air. Thank you.